Hey, how are you? Good. Can you see me? Oh, there you go. Yeah, we yeah, can see, see you. Apologies that you can't see us. Uh, we had an issue with our web. It's for a podcast anyway, but we're going to video it separately, then put that on YouTube. Okay. But, uh, you know, for the purposes of... It was fine on our end. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we'll just get right into it, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, first of all, could you just um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Mark Sargent, and I am currently the freshman recruiter for a wonderful metaphorical place called Flat Earth University. And I believe 100% that the Earth is flat, enclosed, made by God, and um, and it's a beautiful place to live in. How's that? That's great. So, say I don't believe in that the Earth is flat, mm -hmm. could you convince me otherwise? I could try to convince you, but again, what what I the standard line that I use is... I'm not here to convince you, I'm not even here to persuade you, all I'm here is to plant the seed. And at the end of the day, just ask you to do your own research and ask questions. But yeah, I could throw you a whole bunch of arguments that hint that the Earth is actually flat. Well, let's talk about that then. So what would you say is the biggest piece of evidence that you have to convince someone who is not a flat earther? Sure. The, the, the biggest piece of evidence I would give, the most common one anyway, that everyone uses because it's the easiest to understand would be long distance photography meaning no one can find the curvature. Everyone thinks the curvature is there, everyone thinks they've seen the curvature, but when you try to do it with photography, you can't find it. And what I mean by that, uh, not necessarily left to right, because you wouldn't be able to detect it anyway, because we're so small uh, on this vast, vast place, but forward and back. So everybody knows that ships go over the horizon, right? That's the argument most people are gonna throw at you. If you if you try to discount the space agencies because they're all fake since day one, uh, the ship's going with the horizon. That that should prove that there's curvature right there. And ten years ago, I would have absolutely been there with you. I would have said that yeah yeah the, the boats go over the horizon. But then HD technology came out with cameras with HD zoom, and now boats that supposedly are gone we can pull back into frame. And you're saying okay, what does that prove? Well, if the standard science calculation for the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared which and that's not supposed to be scary math or anything that's eight inches per mile per mile so at three miles it's three times three which is nine times eight is 72 inches 10 miles is 10 times 10 800 inches and that goes on and on to where 50 miles is almost 1700 feet of curvature well <clears throat> sooner or later those boats those ships the 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 lighthouses whatever landmass should be on the other side of the curve it should be behind the curve uh it should be on the other side of the hill that's just not the case anymore to where we can zoom in on things i don't know uh, until the atmosphere gets too thick probably 150 miles away that's not possible that can't be possible on a curved earth and people say oh it's, it's refraction it's a, it's a mirage it's like nope it's clear as day we can do time lapse on it all day long in all weather conditions and all light conditions and just about any object so there you go and by the way we can run a little long the the television people didn't realize they had to catch a ferry to get here so <laughs> They called and they, and they said, so we can, we can, we can run long. I, and I say that because I know my answers aren't exactly brief sometimes. Yeah. All right. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, for your, for your personal story, can you tell us a little bit what led you, uh, from person who thought the earth was a globe to being a fly author? What was your story? Sure. Sure. And by the way, thank you for using the word globe. Most people will use the word round. <laughs> And, and I try to tell them, it's like round can be two-dimensional as well. You know, your dinner plate is round. A dining room table is round, technically. Uh, we Flat earthers never use the word round. We always use ball, sphere, globe. How I got into it was, like most people, how they got into it. They hated it. They tried to disprove it. They tried to debunk it. And then fell down the rabbit hole and couldn't get out again. So in 2014, I had looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of. I had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of. And uh, everyone knows about Flat Earth. It's, it's never, I've never run into a person where I say, oh yeah, Flat Earth. And they say, never heard of it. Everyone knows about it. And so I said, okay, well, it's on my bucket list. I'm older. So I'm going to knock it out. I'm going to disprove it in a weekend. Shouldn't be very hard to do, right? 
three days later, I'm going, okay, I'm going to keep going on this. And then fast forward nine months to where at the beginning of 2015, I couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. I couldn't do it. And so I said, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to make a series of videos and put them out on the internet and, and ask the internet hive mind because the internet hive mind is very, very intelligent. Say, okay, here's what I think is happening. I don't think it's a globe anymore. I think it actually could be a building, a structure, uh, a Truman show. Uh, tell me where I'm, where I might be wrong. And all of a sudden people started writing me saying, no, 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 no. You, you, you may be onto something here. And here we are four years later, uh, with hundreds of interviews. We've got conferences. I'm doing conferences in six countries this year and it's incredible. So that's how I got into it. So why do you think NASA would lie to us then? NASA lies because like any other space agency, meaning, let me back up a bit. What I'm saying here is that one, human beings had nothing to do with the building of this place. And the only thing we did was discover it. And we didn't even have the technology to discover it until almost 1960. You know, we have 5,000 years of unbroken history. And then really up until 1960, we did not know. And so when they found out, they had to keep this thing under wraps. They, they, you know, hide it from the public until they figured out a way to introduce it to civilization so that people didn't burn the whole place down. So you had to militarize space. And NASA is absolutely 100% military. Uh, they are Department of Defense. I know they wear white uniforms. They smile for the camera. They don't carry guns, but they are absolutely DOD. And so they, they militarize space because you don't want the private sector getting up there. Basically, you have to seal off the upper edge. You have to keep the general public from doing their own space missions, which is why 99% of all the space stuff up until very, very recently has been military. There you go. Well, how do you in explain spacex oh yeah it? yeah yeah yeah. no space no spacex eventually okay sooner or later you you can't you can't keep the pub the private sector out entirely especially once wealth starts increasing and you get billionaires that are bored that don't have anything to do like uh, the guy from google or richard branson or elon musk and by the way elon musk uh is not exactly uh, a space guy. He made his money. He was a software developer. He made his money on PayPal. Right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to space, are we talking about the SpaceX Tesla Roaster in space or just the private company SpaceX? Uh, well, as a whole, as I'll try to launch into space, get into space, putting the car into space, everything as a whole, the fact that they've managed that and, you know, why would NASA want to SpaceX in? Oh, you mean why would why would NASA even allow SpaceX to happen? Yeah, because surely then Elon Musk and his company could prove that. Oh, that oh work. yeah, no, no. Space SpaceX has infiltrated since day one. If you started a space company tomorrow, where are you going to get your people? Um, if you start all of a sudden collecting resumes, almost every resume you get is going to be from the military, because up until now, that's all there was. You know, everyone that worked in a space agency was working for NASA or one of the other countries that that are tied to uh, their space program. So, and SpaceX, they haven't really done anything. That's, that's the part that kills me. Everybody thinks that, oh, SpaceX is doing all this stuff. You got to remember that in 2017, Elon said he was going to take two people around the moon uh, by 2018. That's 2019 now. It never happens. Not even, not even close. Uh, the closest thing he ever did was supposedly put a Tesla Roadster into space. And that thing was fake since absolutely second one. There were so many things. I mean, I could, I could spend an hour just ripping apart that whole thing. But what have they done? They, they've never sent a manned capsule anywhere. They talk about going to Mars. They, it, all they do is reinforce what I, what I call a space beat, which is they just put out headlines. That's all they do. Again, remember, Elon Musk, there was a headline that, um, that the New York Post ran uh, last year. It's called, it literally said, Elon Musk is a total fraud. And I applauded it because every promise he's ever made on anything, not just SpaceX, but anything, he's never, ever delivered. Uh, solar panels to sold, solve the Puerto Rico power problem, uh, underground bullet train between uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, rocket planes that can go to China in a couple hours that cost as much as a business class ticket. Uh, it just goes on and on. Oh, two people going around the moon. He never, ever delivers. He's just a guy that makes headlines. That's all he does. What about NASA? So I say NASA started off... Um, you know, with the Russians and getting to space fast. And it was a lot to do with nuclear arms race. Where does Russia's, 
you know, where, where is Russia's part in the space? Where, where is thing? Russia? Russia was and in on it with us. Just controlled by. So, so if you think then NASA, you know, is militarizing uh, space, yeah. where is the other countries, America's uh, historic enemies? Where are they in space? Where is China? Where is Russia? At, at the highest level, and this is going to blow you away, at the highest level, there are no en enemies. At the lowest level, yeah, of course, the space race and, and the Cold War and America, you know, hates Russia and Russia hates America. But the, at the highest level, that's not the case. Uh, as a matter of fact, we haven't even, most people don't know this, We, the United States space program doesn't even launch from the United States anymore. It launches from Russia and, and returns supposedly from Russia. It's like using Russian airspace. It's like, even though the headlines say, oh, you know, Russia, we've been squaring off this, this imaginary fight between the Americans and the Russians for what, 50 years, 60 years? It's never ever happened? Come on, two biggest kids in the block and they never ever square off? No. No, I, so, I'm not not shy about saying that. As far as the, the Chinese, every other space program blueprinted off NASA. Now, does that mean that everybody that works at these space programs is in on it? No, no. 99% of the people that, that work there just turn wrenches. They build fuel systems and polish capsules and do all that other fun stuff. It's only the telemetry guys that need to know. Only the data, the programmers. They're the only, the, the only people that need to know about anything. So you said it may be a structure and... Uh... You know, people didn't create this. How do you, do you explain that through religion or God, or how, how do you explain like if it's a Truman type show? You know, if, if how do you explain that? Then what we're on? You mean oh, you mean the actual physical dimensions of it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what we're talking about here is a building. You are in a planetarium, a terrarium, a Hollywood studio. Uh, something with walls and a floor and a ceiling that's all mechanical. It is all artificial. There is nothing organic about this place at all. Uh, what we're saying, uh, the, the short version would be you're living in a box, a giant room. And inside that room is a salt lake, a, a massive, massive salt lake that's 20,000 miles wide. And inside that salt lake are islands, which we call continents. And it's so big that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until about 1960. And those best and brightest would have been the United States and the Soviet Union when they were looking for the outer marker. They were looking for the outer marker. They knew about the, the, the centerpiece of this thing back in 1926. And then they took their best military guys and they basically flew them around Antarctica for a better part of 30 years, all the way up until the mid-1950s. And when they figured it out, that's when they had to seal off the outer edge and the upper edge, which was why the Antarctic Treaty, the unbroken treaty that's never, the only treaty in the history of treaties that's never ever been broken was put in place that says that no country can set up shop there from a corporate standpoint. No business can ever go down there, ever. And it's not even up to re for review until the year 2041. So do you have any proof then that it is kind of like the Truman Show and that it is a big Hollywood production set? Proof. If I had absolute proof, I wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd be on the cover of every magazine in the world. Can I prove to you without, without, even, without question that the world is flat? No. But I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe, if you treat it like a court case, so much reasonable doubt in the globe that by the end of the day, or wherever, however long it takes you to get through this, you have nowhere else to turn but some sort of flat model. There's nowhere else to go. The globe becomes hollow. It becomes a, an empty cardboard box that you that you can't there's no there's no substance to it at all so who stands to benefit from this like then who who's the benefit right in the end? right why do it right why and one out of every 10 people ask me that it's like why why hide it why keep it a big secret well think of it this way if all of a sudden and you remember if let's say you don't discover this until about 1960 do you tell the public, let's say you guys, and this question I'll put to you, you don't have to answer it. It's rhetorical. But I say, let's say you figure it out in 1960. Do you tell the general public, even though after 500 years, you've been telling them the exact opposite? And you say, what's the worst that can happen? Well, three quick things. Uh, one, academically, literally overnight, uh, think about every university, every university in every country. There's a lot of them. Uh, astrophysics and astronomy, those things have to shut down overnight. They don't reopen. And then the remaining physical sciences, geology, hydrology, archaeology, biology, just take your pick. They all have to retool from the ground up. University libraries would be in utter chaos for forever, for a very, very long time. And that's just academically. Economically, you would have to suspend world trading markets for months 
just to figure out what happens next. Where, you know, where, what, what impact does this have on the economy of the world? And then last but not least, uh, it, in fact, it's probably the most important, is you're giving the big five religions of the world, the big five houses, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, you're giving them all leverage against science. And you're asking them to show restraint. You're saying, oh yeah, by the way, we know that science has been beating your, over you over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries, at least. Uh, but now that you know this, you probably shouldn't seek revenge. And are you kidding? Religion would come at him with, with pitchforks and say, okay, so you were wrong about something really, really big. What about some of the other stuff like carbon dating, like evolution, like the Big Bang Theory, like dark matter? And it goes on and on and on. It would never end. Between those three things, oh yeah, you absolutely keep this thing a secret. Uh, it's a question of power and control, which is... if as the, Go ahead. Doesn't the point of science, though, is that you know, when you come up with a, with a hypothesis, yeah. then everybody else is trying to prove that wrong. And, you know, when people discovered germs and the things were tiny and you can't see them with your eyes, sure. you know, people did used to think the world was flat and, and then science disproved that. So there have been big revelations. Oh, no, 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 no. Stop right there. How, when, when did they disprove it exactly? You remember, they were telling people that the Earth was a globe for 500 years and the space program wasn't even created until 1958. So how do you know for sure? And if you, you come at me with math, no, 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 math is not going to save you, unfortunately. The average person barely knows algebra, if that. And you're going to come at it with geometry and trig and calculus and quantum mechanics? No, th that's not going to fly. Until you go high enough to take a shot of the Earth, you don't know anything. And, and I will compare that to this. It's like, what does the core of the Earth look like? And you're, you probably imagine that cross section with the uh, the red and the orange and the yellow and the white bands going all the way through. And supposedly, remember, it's 4,000 miles to the center of the earth. You know what the deepest hole ever drilled is? It's eight miles by the Germans and the Soviets. Could never go past eight miles, no matter what. Because of the heat, though, and the heat. And no, no, the no, 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 no. Unless you know what the core of the earth is, you don't know. If you've only drilled down a fraction of 1%, you haven't gone anywhere. Yeah, but if you, if you know that, like people know that stars, you know, and galaxies far, far away, uh, what compounds they have. So, uh, you know, if there's a lot of mass on the planet, then it's churning on the inside. Then that creates heat, which is, you know, the reason why certain. So, so you're you're saying that the core, the cross section we see the in the in the textbooks, the cross section of the Earth, that's absolutely gospel. That is absolutely one hundred percent true. You've seen, so we don't obviously know that. We, we can't imagine what it looks like because we're not seeing it, but it's an, an artist's impression. But they, 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 they might know what, you know, molecules are there, what, uh, what temperature it might be, things like that. Well, okay, it, it, then why are we tell? And they're also saying what the cross-section is of Jupiter and Mars and Neptune and Saturn. And again, what you're seeing in the sky is a pretty, pretty light show. No different than a planetarium. And I know I'm older and you guys probably haven't been to a planetarium. But when you go there, you see the moon and the stars and every, and the planets. Can you land on them? No. And and I say, why not? And you say, well, because we're in a... Oh, crap. I'm sorry. And I say, uh, why not? And you say, because we're in a building. And I say, absolutely right. Who's to say that when you walk out of that planetarium, you're just not in a much, much bigger one? So could you explain you know, so gravity works then? Sure. Gravity, by science standards, by the way, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the most famous scientist in the world, says that we can't tell you what gravity is. We can only tell you what gravity does. We can only tell you the symptoms of gravity because we can't replicate gravity in a lab, meaning we can't create a simulated gravity. Uh, they say that gravity is a magical molecular force that pulls things down to the center of the earth. And for me, gravity is a magical molecular force that pulls things straight down that's there's almost no difference for me that the the myth that most flat earthers think that uh gravity is because we're a disc flying in space upwards at what nine meters per second per second no no most people don't believe that at all they either believe in density or they believe in a molecular force So, if, so you, you agree and by the way, we're, this, we're not talking about, I know the artist's impression, sorry, I got to throw this out there. It, we're not talking about a disc floating in space. We're talking about a box that could be sitting on a table somewhere in some lab. That's all we're talking about. There is no space. There never was. It's an illusion. It's just something that was told to us. Uh, so 
you know, when you're trying to convince someone, uh, yes. you know, uh, some people will probably throw this question at you and say, why believe you over the entirety of scientific literature, peer-reviewed studies, astronauts, and basically what every scientist says is true? Right. Well, why, why believe yourself over that? Okay. Uh, and, and I say, don't believe me. Don't believe a word I'm saying. Do your own research and ask questions. If you believe the men in the lab coats, that's fine. That author, so, could you just, that author just as he started your sentence. I'm sorry, what? And the video just cut off as soon as you started your sentence. Oh, okay. So what I'm saying is uh, don't, don't believe a thing I'm saying. Uh, do your own research and ask questions. Don't think for a second, though, that science is infallible. One of the most arrogant things I ever heard from science was that science is right whether or not you believe in it. Well, that's fine. If you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level, yeah, absolutely. It's something I can test for myself. You want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like? No. You want to tell me what dark matter is? That's absolutely theoretical. You want to tell me what gravity is? Even mainstream science is, says they, they don't know what gravity is. Science makes mistakes all the time. The, the One of perfect example would be um, father of thermodynamics, Lord William Kelvin. Brilliant man, right? Literally, he is, his name is mentioned every day. Absolute temperatures use his name in honor of him. And yet, what else is he most famous for? Than, than even more than the Kelvin thing. He told people that airplanes are never, ever going to happen. Even though there were airplanes being built in his lifetime. He said it was never, ever going to happen. Popular Mechanics said that, oh, no, there's no future in the history of airplanes. That's not, Popular Mechanics. Never, never going to happen. So don't tell me that science is infallible. They make mistakes and they're corruptible like anyone else. Just because they have academic peer review doesn't mean that they won't take the bribes. But scientists need Porsches too. Uh, and if you think I'm joking, look at every time they cut corners to rush products to market. Uh, everything from, I don't know, lead paint, lead gasoline, DDT, all the forms of DDT, asbestos. And oh, I don't know, how about all the scientists that said that smoking was absolutely fine for us? Sorry, I had to go on the, the offensive on that one. Um, so I guess the beauty of science is that it isn't infallible. And, you know, th there is obviously corruption. There's been, you know, w w when scientists who studies in conjunction with companies on something they're st studying. So, if, you know, if a company's polluting war and science study that and they say, oh, that's fine. Sure. That, that's true, but... Uh, you know, that doesn't mean you should discount everything. No, no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't discount everything. Absolutely. No, trust me. We're talking, you know, this technology that we're using, we're talking on right now, we're sending video is because of science. Science does some wonderful things, of course, but scientists don't know when to pull back and they make leaps of faith like any other religion and why science, we, we don't go after science. We go after scientism, which is when science makes leaps of faith and they put their stamps on things without absolute proof because they know that the general public will believe it that's when it becomes scientism uh, let me give you a quick quote from uh, um, george orwell he said this in 1946 when and he was not a flat earther but he was talking about the responsibility of science to not go that far which was he said that you know if you went out to the street and asked people how they know the world was a globe they would say the first response is what are you talking about we know it's given we everybody knows it's flat or, I'm sorry, wow, sorry, knows it's a globe. And then you come back and say, well, how do you know? And then they get upset because, well, in 1946, there were no space programs. So how would everybody in the world know in 1946 that it was a globe? There was no, there was no evidence of this. They didn't know because they had proof. They knew because they were told it was a globe. There's a huge, huge difference there. Science has a massive responsibility and they have been going down a slippery slope for a long, long time. And I'm part of a group that's here to correct that. So why do you think the flat earth movement is grown and it just keeps on growing then? Um, because it's easy to understand. Uh, the, the big thing is social media. Social media has changed the game in that we have now created through a hive mind mentality, you know, all people, we've created a way to explain the world that is easier than the current model. Meaning flat earth is now easier to explain to somebody than uh, the, the, the heliocentric model. I mean, uh, by leaps and bounds. So, you know, the, remember that the globe doesn't, you know, if you had a globe here and a flat earth model here, the globe doesn't survive on its own. It needs a massive support system. It needs a sun and a solar system around that and a galaxy around that and a universe around that. If you have a flat model, you know, just a little snow globe that you're holding in your hand, 
That's all you need. The whole thing's artificial. It's mechanical. And that's why it's spreading. Plus, it's the most got to be not only is it the most polarizing topic I've ever seen in my life. It is the most interesting. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented. Flat Earth is bigger than you. Flat Earth is more interesting than you. And it's more interesting than your group. It's more interesting than your country. And that's why it just spreads. It's a great. Come on. Let's face it. When when we, you talk to people on the street, when you run into a friend, you know, after you talk about the weather and sports teams and whatever else, usually the conversation ends with, hey, I heard something interesting. You swap interesting stories. Flat Earth always seems to get into the conversation now. And it just spreads like a virus, which is weird. So, what... So, but a lot of people believe, uh, may disagree, but they say, oh, it's harmless. What real life impact does believing in a flat earth as opposed to a globe have on the world? How does that change the world? Does it change at all? Is it just a bunch of people who think a certain way? No, no, no. It changes everything. Um, the biggest thing, and I don't want to, I don't want to beat on the religious side too much, even though the people that are coming to interview me in a bit are, are from a, a big religious television thing. Um, it's because, think of it this way, the heliocentric model, the globe model, says that you're just this tiny little rock covered with this impossible sheen of water, which is also covered by a tiny, tiny wisp of smoke, and you're flying in five different directions through the universe, and you mean nothing. You have no purpose. Your life is accidental, and you're meaningless. Flat Earth is the exact opposite. If Flat Earth is real and you are inside a building that was constructed by a creator, then your life absolutely has purpose. Now, you don't know exactly what that purpose is, but you know that this place was built with you in mind. And it's a, a, a massive awakening for people. They feel like, like they've got something to, to live for, something to shoot for. And it's inspiring. Flat Earth is different than any other conspiracy out there. It is a message of hope. And I, I, again, I'm humbled that I could even be a part of it. But yeah, that's what it is. That's how it changes the world. So many people, um, because people, so if you're an atheist and you believe there is a globe and you believe, as you said, it's random, you know, on a speck of art somewhere that isn't even 0.1% of the universe, right. you can create your own meaning and your own value in life. It doesn't mean your life is valueless or meaningless. If the earth is a globe, you can make your own value, you can help family, friends, and you can be happy. Uh, Surely you, you can't, you can, yeah, you know, I get it. You can be. Um, but remember, science has is, has always been in direct opposition of spirituality, of God. I mean, the Big Bang Theory is literally their creation. And, you know, the argue, it's the oldest question ever, which is, okay, well, what happened before Big Bang? You know, what, what, what happened? Well, there was nothing. There was just the Big Bang. It's like, well, isn't that sort of the same as God creating the universe? Uh, so, and I'm not saying that that you can't believe in atheism and also, I mean, you know, can you be an atheist and also believe in flat earth? You can, but it's really, really tough because at that point you're kind of splitting hairs because at the very least, if you were an atheist, you'd have to say, okay, well, if it's not God, then it's probably an advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves that created it. And uh, atheism is going to be tricky for, for, for flat earthers. Not a lot of them out there. So what do your friends and family think of you being a flat earther then? Really varies. It depends. I mean, it's not just friends and family. It's, it's just people that you talk to. It depends on their educational background, depends on their family background. You know, do they have members in aerospace? Do they have friends that are pilots? Um, it, it, it really, really depends. I've, I've seen both in like in my family, for example, mom loves it. Uh, my sister hates it with a passion. Uh, I've got cousins that are in the closet. And in fact, most, you know, remember 90% of our community is in the closet. They won't come out because they're afraid of backlash from friends and family and coworkers. So for them, they, you know, for me, it's not so bad because I was always pretty eccentric growing up anyway. Uh, but for a lot of people, it's a scary time, which is why the, the regional meetups do so well. The conferences do so well. In fact, we've got a conference in your neck of the woods in, um, in the UK, middle of September. Uh, but the, the meetup, it's... Anyway, sorry, I ramble. Go. What else you got? So, if you're flying a plane, because you mentioned uh, pilots, yes, uh, and 
say you we live in Scotland. Say you're going to Scotland and you want to go to uh, say you want to go to the western uh, part of America. You, you want to go to California. Right. So you take the and you go past China. So on a flat Earth model, that can happen, kind of, because you're going east and then you end up in the west. So why does why do planes not just fall off? How how does a plane go east to China and end up in America on the west? All right. First off, and, and let's let's back up a second. Which is remember, if we are talking about because whoever you're presenting this to, they may not because we're. Uh, you know what? I should grab the visual map. Hang on. Give me one second. Okay. So, if this is what it looks like, uh, this, is pro this will help you guys a whole bunch, and I know you've seen this before. I mean, remember, if, like, for example, the, the, the first question people say is, well, if you leave wherever you leave and you fly straight, eventually you're going to come back around and come back to the same spot. Doesn't that mean you're on a globe? Because we all know that, right? On a, on a globe, you can come back to the same spot. Well, if you run your finger around this, you know, in a big circle, like you're, you're technically, you did circumnavigate it. Does that mean that this is a sphere? No, you left and you came back to the same spot. So why not? And you say, well, but that's not, that's different from a globe because a globe is you're not making a slow left-hand turn or a slow right-hand turn. You're just going straight. I'm going, yes, but you got to remember the GPS system that is basically how you work this thing. Uh, that was designed by the Americans, the American military. That's DOD that was designed in the 90s. The GPS system will tell you where it wants, you know, where it thinks you want to go. And it will also show you the route, but it'll, it'll put it on a globe model for you. And you won't know any different. It's pretty genius. So what do you think would happen if we went to the edge of the earth? Then? What's it, the, the edge of the earth? Well, the edge of the earth is way, way further away than this thing. Uh, again, remember the white part on the out edge, or on the outer edge there, that's just the beginning of the ends of the earth. Uh, most people think that, okay, we're talking about a cosmic waterfall, which is why I say there's no, we're talking about a building with a giant saltwater lake on the inside. What I'm saying is the edge of the earth would be thousands of miles inland from the Antarctic coastline. The Antarctic coastline is just the beginning of the edge. You remember the, the United States and the Soviets were looking with their military for the better part of 30 years out there. And then when they discovered it in about 1956, roughly, that's when they put the treaty in place. So if you got out to the edge, whatever, whatever the barrier is, well, you're not getting past it. I know that. They tried to break through it for four years with atomic weapons, didn't do a damn thing. So what, what's the edge made out of? That's your, probably your follow-up question. <sighs> Take your pick. High frequency, electromagnetic field, force field, heavy element, heavy water, whatever it is, it is impermeable. You cannot get past it with, with brute force anyway. Have you tried to just take a boat out and try and set sail, go flat towards what you could think is the edge of the earth and just see what happens once you get far enough? What's the question there? You mean, ha it, would I take a boat or have I tried to take a boat to the edge of the earth? Both. The Antarctic Treaty forbids it. Seriously, look it up if you get a chance. The Antarctic Treaty is bulletproof. You cannot go do any exploration out there without massive permits. Uh, you're not you're not going out there. It's the the treaty basically says that you can't. We got to remember nobody owns Antarctica at all, which is weird. Find me any other piece of real estate anywhere that isn't owned by somebody. You cannot go out there unsupervised. And if you think you're going to the South Pole, you're not. The South Pole is just a point on the map that they determined was the South Pole, so you could go out there and take a couple pictures with penguins if you wanted to. No one's going out there. So do you think if you tried, then you would either be steeled some way uh, towards... Uh, if, you tr if you tried to make a break for it, let's say you were rich. And of course, being rich means you have a lot more to lose, which means you're not going to do it. Let's say you had a pilot with a fully fueled 757, and you convince this pilot, let's just bypass the treaty, bypass the military, and just go for broke. Let's see if we can make it out to the edge. Okay, two things you would have to bypass entirely. One would be he'd have to ignore GPS system because the GPS system is going to try to turn him back towards the water. Uh, two, he's going to have to ignore most of his compass headings and is going to have to go visually. Well, that's going to be tough too because remember, visually out in Antarctica, there's almost no land markers. There's nothing out there. On top of, you know, being extremely hostile and 14,000 feet foot up plateau, which just screams go away. 
So, and even if you could ignore all those things and get a pilot and a billionaire to just punch it and go for broke, you're going to get shot down sooner or later. You're never going to be allowed to the edge. And even if you'd make it to the edge, someone's going to catch up to you and say, sorry, you know, glad you saw it, but that's as far as you go. So what kind of evidence would lead you to believe that the Earth is a globe? There's only so two... You, could what what could convince me? And no, that's a good question. Um, there's only two things that could convince me that the Earth is a globe. Um, one would be... The easiest, the, the easiest way, I should say, which is... It's not that cheap, but you wouldn't have to send me to space to do it. Is that is put a 4K camera on the side of a capsule that is actually leaving the Earth and leaving you know heading off into the solar system somewhere uh and by that i mean unedited footage where you hit record you start streaming and you do not stop elon musk had a perfect chance to do that with his spacex car and remember that thing was supposedly going to mars and they shut off the footage as soon as they started heading towards the moon just cut it off entirely it's like why not let it run um that footage has, does not exist anywhere it, no, with any space program, with any probe ever, that footage does not exist. Statistically impossible. That would be the first thing I would do. If you want to do something easier that's down on the ground, uh, yeah, give me a space suit. Give me an astronaut suit because an astronaut suit defies the second law of thermodynamics. Pressure needs a container. And a flexible container like a space suit would go as rigid as a basketball in two seconds in a vacuum. And it doesn't. It's absolutely flexible and articulate. You can move your fingers. You can manipulate electronics. How, how does that happen? What magical technology is in that backpack that stops the vacuum of space? It doesn't exist. It literally defies a law of physics. And it was a brilliant thing. And the, the reason why they pulled it off, the Americans, was uh, because most people aren't taught anything about physics. And literally nothing. And so all they had to do was film it. It's like, oh, there's astronauts walking around. Nobody even questioned it. It was brilliant. So yeah, put me in, give me an astronaut suit. Put me in a vacuum chamber. Tell me how it works. Tell me how I don't die. Oh, it'd be nice if a scientist went in with their own suit, just so I didn't die alone. There you go. So, at the macro level, do you think one conspiracy theory makes you more likely to believe in it or not? Like yourself, you said you, you were interested before, and you got to this one later in life. Right. Uh, are there any other ones that, that well, to this depart, are there any other ones that grab your attention or you think are true? And secondly, do you take issue with the phrase and conspiracy theory? I'm sorry, that last part you were breaking up. The last one. Uh, do you take an issue with the phase conspiracy theory to describe some of your beliefs? Phase conspiracy theory? The phase? So, so uh, do, do you take issue with, with that description? I'm not I'm not sure. Well, l let me let me answer the first part first and we'll we'll get to the 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 others. Are there other conspiracies that interested me? Sure. Usually the big ones, not the small regional ones like any any sort of shootings, um I consider those rather trivial. By cons by comparison, um just about every American major American war, 9/11, uh JFK, the moon missions of course. The moon missions really really help. If you were into if you don't believe in in the Apollo program, the Americans that, that went to the moon, then it's way easier to get into flat earth because we, you know, we go after NASA pretty quickly. Um and then I even I even have my own conspiracy. I even had one that nobody else had. I have an exclusive one, which is the Panama Canal. I think it's a brilliant conspiracy. But, you know, where we knew we were going to we were going to kill off 6,000 oh stupid solicitors sorry the um where we killed off six thousand civilians and we knew they were going to die from malaria and yellow yellow fever because the french lost twenty thousand men and we sent them anyway that it, by definition is a conspiracy when you hide something for your benefit that harms others um so but as far as the second one you, you're gonna have to say it one more time the, the what conspiracy so the the word conspiracy do you take offense when somebody oh i'm sorry your, your accent was throwing me no offense um <laughs> when, you, when you said offense <laughs> that that's okay when, when you said offense i was going why, why is that word coming out funny um do i take offense to to um being called conspiracy yeah no no not at all i mean it's by definition if you question things that are against the norm uh, you know, you're, you're almost there anyway. Look, conspiracies happen in just about every aspect of our lives. It's just a question of what you're willing to believe and what you're not. I mean, we all know fully, full, full well. I mean, nobody's in, uh, 
lost in this capacity where we know there are conspiracies every day happening in business and politics and sports and entertainment and even journalism and science. There are big conspiracies there all the time. Some are public. Most of them don't get caught. So what? this shouldn't come as a huge shock. What We, we lie about it. It's a world of deception. We lie about everything, especially the Americans. No offense to you guys. I'm sure you're wonderful people, but the Americans lie about everything. And so this, this is not, a, this was not, a, I mean, yeah, it's a big, big thing. I mean, it's overwhelming, but once you get your head around, it's like, oh, okay, now I see it. Why wouldn't you lie about it? I mean, I would too. I, I'm, I'm the first person to say that if I knew in 1960 that this found out what the world actually was like, I absolutely would lie to the public because I would treat it the same way they did, which is, okay, we've got to figure out, you know, let's just keep this thing to ourselves until we can figure out how to introduce this to the public, which is why, why I think it's coming out now in, in that, uh, you know, yeah, it's part of it's a grassroots operation, but I think they're also allowing it to happen, uh, uh, between social media and 6 billion smartphones, you've got the perfect infrastructure to get everybody on the same page simultaneously, get them all there. You could you you could you could spin any story you wanted. So that's what I'm kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm waiting for something else to come along that Flat Earth is tied to. So we've got a few last questions. Sure. So we'll try no, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. Um. So what do you think the future of the Flat Earth movement is, and is it a rising one, and is it one that eclipses, uh, you know, pun intended, uh, <laughs> eclipses uh, the 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 globe? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 every time I don't think it's going to get bigger, it does. Uh for whatever reason, uh we got to remember we've been kind of helped by mainstream now for a while. Um if Google want, you know, Google is the parent company, this massive corporation of YouTube. If they wanted to shut us down, they could have. They could have easily done it. They could have easily um you know, made it to where we weren't recommended to so many people and we didn't show up in search engines so many times. And we were. We were overwhelming to where even our government had to get involved to try to solve the flat earth problem that was happening in social media, which is a weird thing to say. So yeah, we're almost at critical mass now. I mean, we've 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 hit just about every major media platform in one way or the other, with the exception of primetime media. Meaning, um, you know, the big networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, uh, CNN, we, they've covered us on the Internet, but they haven't covered us in prime time. Uh, I don't know what exactly they're waiting for. But so, yeah, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. I mean, I'm doing conferences now. Next week, I'm going to a conference in Auckland, followed by Calgary, Canada, Stockholm, UK, Mount Shasta, California, Amsterdam and Dallas. And these are just ones I'm speaking at. And I'm, and that's not even all of them. I mean, there's Christian-based conferences. There's alternative conferences that are all covering the topics. So, again, I'm just a freshman recruiter. I'm, I'm just, you know, just help people get in. You know, I, I there's no official leader of Flat Earth. So, it, you know, it's, it's all based on, on content and merit. You know, you make content. It's out on the Internet. And if social media, if it resonates with them, great, fantastic. Uh, if it doesn't, you find something else to do. Sorry. So back to the topic of the moon. So what exactly is the moon then? Have we gone to the moon? No, no, nobody's gone to the moon. No, the moon, the moon is not landable. The moon, the Apollo missions have aged terribly. The photography, the video is just aged horribly over the years, which is weird considering historical footage should not age. It should not be dated as well as, as that is. No, you can't land on the moon. Is the moon three-dimensional or is it two-dimensional? I'm not sure. All I can tell you is, is that it is very, very small in the sky. It is not 2000 miles wide. It's probably less than 50 miles wide and it generates its own light source. It's not reflecting anything off of the sun. And if you think I'm kidding, cause it sounds really, really weird, uh, take a point and click infrared thermometer and check out the moonlight versus the moon shade is it's the exact opposite of the sunlight. So if it's, I'm not going to convert it to Celsius for you guys. Uh, but if it's 90 degrees in the sun, it's 80 degrees in the shade. We all know that because the object blocks some of the sunlight. Well, in the moonlight, it's opposite. So if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees in the moonshade. It's in fact up to 13 degrees Fahrenheit. And that shouldn't be possible. There, in, and in fact, I didn't even know this technology existed for us. We can do this now. Most people know that when you shine a laser at something, it's hot. You know, it generates heat. Well, if you change the frequency on the laser, you can actually make it cold. It's, it's weird. You'd think it, it, that wouldn't be possible, but it but absolutely is. And it's, it's a cold laser. 
So the question is, why is the moon generating a cold laser light? And it's absolutely provable. I've, I've done it myself. Many people have done it. And, so, and does that prove it's a flat Earth? No. But it completely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because if the moon is reflecting part of the sun's radiation, at the very least, it should be neutral. It should never go negative. Science will not address it. In fact, I, I threw that question at, at a physicist in Georgetown. And he would not. Would not. Even though we had a scheduled interview, once I brought up that question, pff, gone. He wasn't going to talk about it. So, weird stuff. So at the end of the documentary uh, behind the curve, um, some flat earthers decided to test uh, in a scientific way, uh, you know, if the earth was flat or a globe. Right. Uh, their test results, you know, in, in the documentary didn't seem to support their pre-established conclusions. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it... Sorry, you're, break... yeah. you're breaking up. Did you want me to comment you... on the on the test at the end of the documentary? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one, the power of editing. <laughs> Which is, you have got to remember, the director of that film, Daniel Clark, by the time he got to the end, hated Flat Earth. Oh, he hated it so much. Um, he didn't hate us. You know, I spent seven months with the guy off and on, you know, do, shooting this thing. A lot, and I had nothing to do with the editing process at all. And things changed for him when, and I, I don't know if you guys remember it, when that 12-year-old kid came up and asked questions, you know, when I was up on stage, when he was up on the, up on the microphone. <laughs> That really bothered bothered the director and, and the producers a lot because it's like, well, you're affecting the children now, which means you're affecting the future and we can't have that. And so he decided to spin it any way he could. Uh, the, the shots with Jaron, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, they didn't even have line of sight. There were two, two experiments. First off, the, the laser condenser melted, didn't show that during the documentary. Uh, that was during the first test. And the second one, he didn't even have line of sight. Now, truth is, Jaron should have known better. And he should have tested it out during the day. And it's, it's a rookie mistake, which is you do not do the test for the first time live on camera. In You know, you, you make sure you do the test beforehand so that you're ready when, when they're there. So they didn't have line of sight. And so, but the way Daniel edited it, he made it seem like, oh, well, there's, there's obviously a curvature. No, no, there wasn't. And Jaron went back later only because it's like, he goes, where, where did I screw up? And he's like, oh, okay, that's, that's where he screwed up. Got to remember that also Daniel, uh, here's a small little editing thing for me, the, the famous green button shot. And Daniel came to me and said, hey, can I leave this in? And it's like, yeah, you can, sure, take your, take your poke at me. Which was that I supposedly at the Space Center at NASA missed hitting the green button. And I kept hitting the, the touch screen up above. And it's like, no, I hit the green button as soon as I sat down. But all Daniel had to do was edit out five seconds of video, and it made me look like I was missing the obvious. If I missed the green yeah. button, yeah. then I obviously missed the globe, and I'm obviously wrong. And it was brilliant, and, he, and it was completely by accident. He didn't even mean to do it. He just noticed that when we left the frame, because if you know anything about shooting, you, um, you, leave it, you leave the camera there even after the subjects leave to give you a little buffer so that you can, you can edit it. And he noticed that he was just focusing on the green button. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, if we do this, we'll make Mark look like he missed something. I was like, no, no. Again, remember, seven months worth of shooting, they edited down to 99 minutes. The power of editing is incredible. Sorry, go ahead. So the, probably the most well-known uh, conspiracy theory, conspiracy theorist alive today is Alex Jones. Yes. What do you think of Alex Jones? What do you think of the theories that he's put forward? And how do you see him for, uh, for, for conspiracy hey, theories generally? I hate to do this, but your voice is, is, is screwing up the microphone. No, no offense. Can, can she ask the question? <laughs> so, Alex Jones is quite an own like, conspiracy theory person. Yeah. Like, so, what... What is Alex Jones' stunt in conspiracy theories, and do you like him? Uh, no, I don't like him at all. Um, Alex Jones, yeah, he's... Alex Jones, has he moved forward the conspiracy world? Sure. He's done a massive body of work. Uh, but he... No one at this point... I, I won't say that they can't trust him, but he seems to be kind of the court jester of the conspiracy world. He tends to, uh, I mean, you got to remember, most of his stuff is an act. You know, the whole chest pounding and yelling. And you don't have to do that. I mean, I'm living proof. You know, I don't, I really yell at anybody about anything. And I get my point across. And so it, it, how and why he was banned from media, I don't think this was necessarily fair that, that they did that. But at the same time, you know, if it, if it, if it introduced people to 
the conspiracy world just by having him take the hit, yeah, I think it was a good thing. Uh, do I follow his work a lot? No, I don't. I just don't like that personality type. It's just too, you know, when it's like, you know, you shouldn't trust the government. I'm not going to do an Alex Jones impersonation because it'd probably burst a blood vessel. Uh, but yeah, he's 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 not loved in our circles. How's that? Yeah, so, so we plan on interviewing a uh, physicist. Sure. Astronomist. Um, is there anything that you would like us to put forward uh, to the person who we interview? Yeah, yeah. Hang on, I'll give you the five questions I threw at the Georgetown guy. One second. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let's see here. Requests. Five science questions. Okay, real fast. Ready? Uh, mm -hmm. and I can, e do want, in fact, do you want me to just email it to you? The, the, qu yeah, the questions I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll email you the questions, but they're real, but they're, they're short. I'll give you the summary of them real quick. One is explain long distance photography, how we can see objects that are on the other side of the curve. Second would be vacuum versus gravity. Tell me where the bleeding edge is. No scientist will ever be able to tell you where our atmosphere ends and the vacuum of space begins because that absolutely uh, violates the law of thermal dynamics, which says that pressure versus non-pressure cannot exist side by side without a barrier. Uh, third would be the eclipse shadow, which is tell me how there, if a moon is 2000 miles wide, why the blackout zone is only 70 miles wide on the ground. And if you say, well, it's because it's, it's condensing it down to 70, it's like, okay, then why doesn't that happen with the earth? Meaning when the earth is in front of the sun, why don't we see a blackout zone that's 250 miles wide on the moon? We don't see any blackout zone at all. We just see a blood moon. That's all we see. Uh, four would be moon temperature. What I was telling you about uh, before, it's like, explain to me how moonlight is actually cooling things down. <laughs> and five, last but not least, would be, and I'll drop this into Skype as soon as we're done. The um, uh, five would be the Van Allen radiation trap question, which to this day, nobody will touch. Which is, and I'll, I'll ask you guys, which is, again, rhetorical. Um, are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? Yes or no? Simple question. If yes, then tell me how the Apollo program did multiple, you know, round trips through the Van Allen belts with no shielding, you know, the aluminum and plastic, which does not stop radiation, and nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, and there's nobody got cancer. There's still five of them walking around today. Everybody died of natural causes. And if you say no, they're not deadly, then I will point you at a NASA, the NASA.gov website, which they have a, a video on there called Orion Trial by Fire, which says that, oh, they're so incredibly deadly that we can't even test capsules with people in them because we have not solved the radiation problem. Well, the, that's, that's a problem because uh, you solved it back in the 1960s. You solved it flawlessly. Nobody's ever had a problem with radiation ever, ever, ever. So why are you telling me that every capsule you're testing right now cannot solve the radiation problem? Why, why is that not the case? Anyway, that's the five questions, and I'll, I'll shoot them to you. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, that's all the questions we've got for you today. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, any yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just any closing... Oh, yeah, closing yeah. My closing re remarks is this. It's like, look, don't... Whatever I'm saying here, just don't believe it uh, you know just on at face value which i ask about anybody anything including science do your own research and ask questions look into this for yourself you'll find the answers one way or the other and you'll resolve it for yourself uh j there, there's a saying that that i i love so much which is trust everybody but count your change there you go right well you know certainly don't agree but i appreciate you coming on and oh, no. having it's fine we'll Yes, thank you Definitely. very much. Uh, once we're done, uh, we'll we'll send you our podcast, or if we put this on YouTube or any other site, we'll send you that too, right? Sounds great. Thank you very much, and uh, thank thanks thanks guys for reaching out. No thank you. Bye. Okay. Enjoy your interview. Bye bye.